struggle for existence. I've been spoken of in cases where it did not even exist. They wanted to demonstrate that nothing could be explained by it. They spoke of an incidence of natural selection. Moreover, in the last years, the breed was able to so experimentally that changes of one life run into another can occur by least mutation. With this, what was regarded as a firm article of faith by the Darwinists, namely that animal and plant forms change only gradually to shape it. More and more the ground on with one that built for decades from people to appear to need one field. Even earlier, even scientists had realized that they had to abandon this ground and thus double age. Rawl, who died young, in 1884 declared in his book, Biologist Problemic, Google like ALS for such servants of one minor race and elementic biological problems given the health of the development of rational methods and the introduction of insatiability to the Darwinian principle of the struggle for life become acceptable. Because it is only then that we have no explanation for the fact that wherever it can, a creature acquires more than it needs for maintaining that it grows to access where the invasion to persist in. While for the Darwinists there is no struggle for existence wherever the existence of a creature is not threatened, for me the struggle is an omnipresent one. It is primarily a struggle for life, a struggle for the increase of life, not a struggle for existence. It is only natural that in view of these facts the judicial be back to themselves. The materialistic universe of thought is not fit for the construction of a world conception. If we base ourselves on it, we cannot say anything about mental and spiritual phenomena. Today there are already numerous scientists who seek to erect a structure of the world for themselves based on quite different ideas. One need only recall the work of the botanist, Reinecke, Die Welt ALS Cat, the world of being. However, it becomes apparent that such scientists have not been trained with impunity amidst purely materialistic ideas. What they utter from their new idealistic standpoint is inadequate satisfy them for a while, but not those who look more deeply into the enigmas of the world. Such scientists cannot bring themselves to approach those methods which proceed from a real contemplation of the mind and the soul. They have the greatest fear of mysticism, or gnosis, or theosophy. This appears clearly. Quoted above. He said, Otherwise, then is implying intellect. 
children use it in vain. What concepts of the life of the soul does such a thinker not reach? At the end of the work referred to above, we read, Prehistoric man formed the idea of the separation of body and soul in face of death. The soul separated itself from the body and led an independent existence. It found no rest and returned as a ghost unless it was banned by sepulchral ceremony. Man was terrorized by fear and superstition. The remains of these ideas have come down to our time. The fear of death, that is, of what is to come after, is widespread today. How differently does all this appear from the standpoint of psychomonism? Since the psychic experiences of the individual only take place when certain regular connections exist, they cease when these connections are in any way disturbed, as happens numberless times in the course of a day. With the bodily changes of death, these connections stop entirely. Thus, no sensation and conception, no thought and no feeling of the individual can remain. The individual soul is dead. Nevertheless, the sensations and thoughts and feelings continue to live. They live beyond the transitory individual and other individual, wherever the same complex of the conditions exist. They are transmitted from individual to individual, from generation to generation, from people to people. They leave as the eternal room of the soul. They work in the history of the human spirit. Thus we all survive after death is linked in the great interconnected chain of spiritual development. But is that something different from the survival of the wave and others which it has caused, itself meanwhile disappearing? Does one really survive when one continues to exist only in one effect? Does one not have such a survival in common with all phenomena, even those of physical nature? One can see that the materialistic world's conception had to undermine its own foundation. As yet it cannot lay new one. Only a true understanding of mysticism, theosophy, and not the will enable it to do so. The chemist Osterwald spoke several years ago at the Congress of Scientists of Lubeck at the overcoming of materialism, and for this purpose founded a new periodical dealing with the philosophy of nature. Science is ready to receive the fruits of a higher world conception. All resistance will avail of nothing. It will have to take into account the needs of the longing human soul. From the Akasha Chronicle Preface. By means of ordinary history, man can learn only a small part of what humanity experienced in prehistory. Historical documents shed light on but a few millennia. What archaeology, paleontology, and geology can teach us is very limited. Furthermore, everything built on external evidence is unreliable. One need only consider how the picture of an event or people, not so very remote from us, has changed when new historical evidence has been discovered. One need to compare the descriptions of one and the same thing is given by different historians, and he will soon realize on what uncertain ground he stands in these matters. Everything belonging to the external world of the senses is subject to time. In addition, time destroys what has originated in time. On the other hand, external history is dependent on what has been preserved in time. Nobody can say that the essential has been preserved if he remains content with external evidence. Everything which comes into being in time has its origin in the eternal. But the eternal is not accessible to sensory perception. Nevertheless, 
the ways to the perception of the eternal are open for man. He can develop forces dormant in him so that he can recognize the eternal. In the essays, we are length, manner, can Mr. Horror and Wilson. How does one attain knowledge of higher worlds? which appear in this periodical asterisk this development is referred to. These present essays will also show that at a certain high level of his cognitive power, man can penetrate to the eternal origins of the things which vanish with time. A man broadens his power of cognition in this way if he is no longer limited to external evidence where knowledge of the past is concerned. Then he can see in events what is not perceptible to the senses, that part which time cannot destroy. He penetrates from transitory to non-transitory history. It is a fact that this history is written in other characters than his ordinary history. In Gnosis and in Theosophy it is called the Akasha Chronicle. Only a faint conception of this chronicle can be given in our language. For our language corresponds to the world of the senses. That which is described by our language at once perceives the character of this sense world. To the uninitiated, who cannot yet convince himself of the reality of a separate spiritual world through his own experience, the initiate easily appears to be a visionary, if not something worse. The one who has acquired the ability to perceive in the spiritual world comes to know past events in their eternal character. They do not stand before him like the dead testimony of history, but appear in full life. In a certain sense, what has happened takes place before him. Those initiated into the reading of such a living script can look back into a much more remote past than is represented by external history, and, on the basis of direct spiritual perception, they can also describe much more dependably the things of which history tells. In order to avoid possible misunderstanding, it should be said that spiritual perception is not infallible. This perception also can err, can see in an inexact, oblique, wrong manner. No man is free from error in this field, no matter how high he stands. Therefore, one should not object when communications emanating from such spiritual sources do not always entirely correspond. But the dependability of observation is much greater here than in the external world of the senses. What various initiates can relate about history and prehistory will be an essential agreement. Such a history and prehistory does in fact exist in all mystery schools. Here for millennia the agreement has been so complete that the conformity existing among external historians of even a single century cannot be compared with it. The initiates describe essentially the same things at all times and in all places. Following this introduction, several chapters from the Akasha Chronicle will be given. First, those events will be described which took place when the so-called Atlantean continent still existed between America and Europe. This part of our Earth's surface was once land. Today this forms the floor of the Atlantic Ocean. Plato tells of the last remnant of this land. The island Poseidon, which lay westward of Europe and Africa. In the story of Atlantis and Lost Lemuria, by W. Scott Elliott, the reader can find that the floor of the Atlantic Ocean was once a continent, that for about a million years it was the scene of a civilization which, to be sure, was quite different from our modern one and the fact that the last remnants of this continent sank in the 10th millennium BC. 
in this present book the intention is to give information which will supplement what is said by Scott Elliott. While he describes more the outer, the external events among our Atlantean ancestors, the aim here is to record some details concerning their spiritual character and the inner nature of the conditions under which they live. Therefore the reader must go back in imagination to a period which lies almost 10,000 years behind us, and which lasted for many millennia. What is described here, however, did not take place only on the continent now covered by the waters of the Atlantic Ocean, but also in the neighboring regions of what today is Asia, Africa, Europe, and America. What took place in these regions later, developed from this earlier civilization. Today I am still obliged to remain silent about the sources of the information given here. One who knows anything at all about such sources will understand why this has to be so. But events can occur which will make a breaking of this silence possible very soon. How much of the knowledge hidden within the Theosophical movement may gradually be communicated depends entirely on the attitude of our contemporaries. Now follows the first of the writings which can be given here. Dash dash dash. After these essays were published in book form, Berlin, 1909. Dash dash dash. Three are Atlantean ancestors. Our Atlantean ancestors differed more from present-day man than he would imagine to acknowledge is confined wholly to the world of the senses. This difference extended not only to the external appearance but also to spiritual faculties. Their knowledge, their technical art, indeed their entire civilization differed from what can be observed today. If we go back to the first periods of Atlantean humanity, we find a mental capacity quite different from ours. Logical reason, the power of arithmetical combining, on which everything rests that is produced today, were totally absent among the first Atlanteans. On the other hand, they had a highly developed memory. This memory was one of their most prominent mental faculties. For example, the Atlantean did not calculate as we do by learning certain rules which he then applied. A multiplication table was something totally unknown in Atlantean times. Nobody impressed upon his intellect that three times four is twelve. In the event that he had to perform such a calculation he could manage because he remembered identical or similar situations. He remembered how it had been on previous occasions. One need only realize that each time a new faculty develops in an organism, an old faculty loses power and acuteness. The man of today is superior to the Atlantean in logical reasoning in the ability to combine. On the other hand, memory has deteriorated. Nowadays man thinks in concepts. The Atlantean thought in images. When an image appeared in his soul, he remembered a great many similar images which he had already experienced. He directed his judgment accordingly. For this reason, all teaching at that time was different from what it became later. It was not calculated to furnish the child with rules to sharpen his reason. Instead, life was presented to him in vivid images, so that later he could remember as much as possible when he had to act under particular conditions. When the child had grown and had gone out into life, for everything he had to do he could remember something similar which had been presented to him in the course of his education. 
Deacon managed best when the new situation was similar to one he had already seen. Under totally new conditions, the Atlantean had to rely on experiment. While in this respect much has been spared modern man due to the fact that he is equipped with rules. He can easily apply these in those situations which are new to him. The Atlantean system of education gave a uniformity to all of life. For long periods things were done again and again in the same way. The faithful memory did not allow anything to develop which was even remotely similar to the rapidity of our present day progress. One did what one had always seen before. One did not invent. One remembered. He was not an authority who had learned much, but rather he who had experienced much and therefore could remember much. In the Atlantean period it would have been impossible for someone to decide an important matter before reaching a certain age. One had confidence only in a person who could look back upon long experience. What has been said here is not true of the initiates and their split. For they are in advance of the stage of development of their period. For admission into such schools, the decisive factor is not age, but whether in his previous incarnation the applicant has acquired the faculty for receiving higher wisdom. The confidence placed in the initiates and their representatives during the Atlantean period is not based on the richness of their personal experience, but rather on the antiquity of their wisdom. In the case of the initiate, personality ceases to have any importance. He is totally in the service of eternal wisdom. Therefore, the characteristic features of a particular period do not apply to him. While the power to think logically is absent among the Atlanteans, especially the earlier ones, in their highly developed memory they possessed something which gave a special character to everything they did. But with the nature of one human power others are always connected. Memory is closer to the deeper natural basis of man and reason, and in connection with it other powers were developed which were still closer to those of subordinate natural beings than our contemporary human powers. Thus the Atlanteans should control what one calls the life force. As today one extracts the energy of heat from coal and transforms it into motive power for our means of locomotion, the Atlanteans knew how to put the germinal energy of organisms into the service of their technology. One can form an idea of this from the following. Think of a kernel of seed grain. In this an energy lies dormant. This energy causes the stock to sprout from the kernel. Nature can awaken this energy with proposals in the sea. Modern man cannot do it at will. He must bury the seed in the ground and use the awakening to the forces of nature. The Atlantean could do something else. He knew how one can change the energy of a pile of grain into technical power, just as modern man can change the heat energy of a pile of coal into such power. Plants were cultivated in the Atlantean period not merely for use of food stuff, but also in order to make the energy dormant and them available to commerce and industry. Just as we have mechanisms for transforming the energy dormant in coal into energy of motion in our locomotive, so the Atlanteans had mechanisms in which they, so to speak, burn plant seeds and in which the life force was transformed into technical and utilizable power. The vehicles of the Atlantean, which floated at short distance above the ground, traveled at a height lower than that of the mountain ranges of the Atlantean period, and they had steering mechanisms by the aid of which they could rise above these mountain ranges. 
one must imagine that if the passage of time all conditions on our earth has changed very much. Today, the above mentioned vehicles of the Atlanteans will be totally useless. Their usefulness depended on the fact that then the cover of air which envelops the earth was much denser than at present. Whether in face of current scientific theories, one can easily imagine such greater density of air must not occupy a sphere. Because of their very nature, science and logical thinking can never decide what is possible or impossible. Their only function is to explain what has been ascertained by experience and observation. The above-mentioned density of air is a burden for a total experience with any fact of the day given by the sense of belief. Equally certain, however, is the fact, perhaps even more at that time the water on the whole earth was much thinner than today. Because of this thinness, the water could be directed by the germinal energy used by the Atlanteans into technical services which today are impossible. As a result of the increase density of the water, it has become impossible to move and to direct it in such a sufficiently clear that the civilization of the Atlantean period is radically different from ours. It will also be understood that the physical nature of an Atlantean was quite different from that of a contemporary man. The Atlantean took into himself water which could be used by the life force inherent in his own body in a manner quite different from that possible in today's physical body. It was due to this that the Atlantean could consciously employ his physical powers in an entirely different way from a man of today. He had, for the speech, the means to increase the physical powers in himself when he needed them for what he was doing. In order to have an accurate conception of the Atlanteans, one must know that their ideas of fatigue and the depletion of forces were quite different from those of present-day man. An Atlantean settlement, it must be evident from everything we have described, had a character which in no way resembles that of a modern city. In such a settlement everything was, on the contrary, still in alliance with nature. Only a vaguely similar picture is given if one should say that in the first Atlantean period, about to the middle of the third subway, a settlement resembled a garden in which the houses were built with trees with archly intertwined branches. What the work of human hands created at that time grew out of nature, and man himself felt wholly related to nature. Hence his social sense also is quite different from that of today. After all, nature is common to all men. What the Atlantean built up on the basis of nature he considered to be common property just as a man of today thinks it only natural to consider as his private property what his ingenuity, his intelligence has created for him. One familiar with the idea that the Atlanteans were equipped with such spiritual and physical powers as have been described, they also understand that in still earlier times mankind presented a picture which reminds him in only a few particulars of what he is accustomed to see today. Not only men, but also the surrounding nature has changed enormously in the course of time. Plant and animal forms have become different. All of earthly nature has been subjected to transformation. Once inhabited regions of earth have been destroyed, others have come into existence. The ancestors of the Atlanteans lived in a region which has disappeared, the main part of which lay south of contemporary Asia. In theosophical writings, they are called the Lemurians. After they had passed through various stages of development, the greatest part of them declined. 
Reed became Stumbled Man. His descendants still inhabit certain parts of the Earth today as so-called Savage Tribe. Only a small part of the Lemurian humanity was capable of further development. From this part the Atlanteans were born. Later, something similar again took place. The greatest part of the Atlantean population declined, and from a small portion are descended the so-called Aryans who comprise present-day civilized humanity. According to the nomenclature of the science of the spirit, the Lemurians, Atlanteans, and Aryans are rude races of mankind. If one imagines that two such rude races preceded the Lemurians and the two will succeed the Aryans in the future, one has seen the total of seven. One always arises from another in the manner just indicated with respect to the Lemurians. Atlanteans, and Aryans. Each new race had physical and mental characteristics which are quite different from those of the preceding ones. While, for example, the Atlanteans especially developed memory and everything connected with. It, at the present time, it is the task of the Aryans to develop the faculty of thought and all that belongs to it. In each new race, various stages must also be gone through. There are always seven of these. In the beginning of a period identified with a new race, its principal characteristics are in a useful condition, slowly they attain maturity and finally enter decline. The population of a new race is thereby divided into seven sub-races. But one must not imagine that one subrace immediately disappears when a new...